All right, so uh, welcome everyone to the Schubert seminar. Uh, today, uh, we're happy to have uh, uh, Colleen Robichaud from UCLA uh, telling us about uh, uh, CM regularity and congealed sting varieties. Uh, please go ahead. Great, is my sound okay? Yes. Okay, great. So today I'm gonna to talk about some joint work with Jenna Ratchgod and Anna Weigand in which we are able to get combinatorial formulas for the Castle Nuovo Mumford regularity of particular Kazdan Lustig varieties using growth and deep polynomials and their combinatorics. And to start, we're going to start with just the complete flag variety. Uh, so those are all of the complete flags from zero to CN. So those are the flags where for your chain of subspaces at every step you want to increase your vector space dimension by one every time. And as many of you know, we can identify the complete fly variety with a quotient of GLN, those complex valued in by an invertible matrices, where this uh, opposite Borel subgroup that we're quotienting by are those lower triangular matrices in GLN. And by taking certain orbits of these Borel subgroups, we can get our Schubert cells, where here this ordinary B is the Borel subgroup, so those upper triangular matrices. And by taking the Zariski closures of our Schubert cells, we get our Schubert varieties. And one particularly nice property that these Schubert varieties have is when we take the closure of these Schubert cells to get Schubert varieties, these varieties will decompose particularly nicely in terms of the Schubert cells. And this decomposition is governed by Bruja order on permutations. Okay. And when we're studying these varieties, of course, one thing we might want to look at are their singularities. So that's what Wu and Yang were doing in 2006, in which they were trying to classify singularities of Schubert varieties uh, in terms of certain pattern avoidance conditions. And one thing that you can do is uh, look at the fixed points under the action of the torus on your Schubert variety, where this torus is going to be those diagonal matrices inside of your Borel subgroup. And we know that any point on our Schubert variety, uh, any point on our Schubert variety is going to be in the Borel orbit of one of these fixed points. So when we're studying local questions about the Schubert varieties, it makes sense just as well to instead study questions about our Schubert varieties, just looking at local neighborhoods of these fixed points. And so that's precisely what they did. And using a theorem of Kazdan Lustig, we know that this intersection of the Schubert variety here, this, this local neighborhood of the Schubert variety near one of these fixed points, is actually going to be isomorphic to the Schubert variety where you've intersected it with an opposite Schubert cell. So for this op opposite Schubert cell, we build that by instead of taking the Borel, or the Borel orbits, we take opposite Borel orbits. Um, and so using this fact, we have that these neighborhoods of Schubert varieties that we were interested in initially are isomorphic to these intersection, intersections of Schubert varieties with opposite Schubert cells, where we end up with an extra factor of affine space hanging off the end. And so what Wu and Yang did is said, well, Let's just study this intersection here and call this the custom Lustig variety. And using the, uh, the Bruja decomposition of these Schubert varieties, it's going to happen that the custom Lustig variety is going to always be indexed by permutations V and W, where V is always going to be greater than or equal to W in Bruja order. And these varieties have very nice defining ideals. In their paper, Wu and Yang give an explicit description that tells you how to define the generators of this ideal. And I'm just going to go over, just so we all 
understand these varieties very well. I'm going to go over an example uh, that will tell us how we can compute these generators for our defining ideal. And we start here in my example, I have V and W. And for these varieties, the permutation W is going to dictate what size of miners I take. And the permutation V is going to tell us what the matrix that we're taking these miners of will look like. Here, I'll start with W to get those, those, uh, that minor size information. And first, what I'm going to do is draw out the Rotha diagram for W. And this is a diagram that's going to be appearing throughout this talk. So I just want to review how we can construct this diagram. So for our permutation W in one line notation, for my Rotha diagram, I start with an n by n grid. So here a four by four grid. And I'm gonna place a bullet or one of these dots in row I column WI. So one gets sent to four by W. So in row one, column four, that gets one of these bullets. And two gets sent to one. So row two, column one gets one of these bullets and so on. And then immediately south, and east of each of these, I want to strike out each of those integer points in the grid. And all of the integer, integer points in this grid that are sort of unnamed by this process, they're never, uh, they never come into play, those get marked with these boxes. And this collection of boxes is precisely the Rotha diagram for the permutation. Now, next we want to compute the rank matrix for W, which we can do just looking at the permutation matrix for W, but we can also read it off by looking at the Rotha diagram. And so how we do that is to compute what the entry should be in a particular, uh, particular entry in this matrix. We look at the corresponding position in the n by n grid. So that would be this position here. And we just will look northwest of that position in our diagram and count how many bullets we see northwest. So here, looking northwest, we see one bullet, so I store a one there in my rank matrix. Whereas if I were to go here, I can see three bullets, which tells me I should store a three in this entry of my rank matrix. All right, so we have the information that we need to tell us what size miners we take. So now let us build the matrix that we're taking these miners of. And for that, all we're basically doing is again, drawing the Rotha diagram for V uh, just in some different symbols. So instead of placing bullets, we place ones in row I column WI. And instead of placing these rays south and east, I'll place zeros south and east. And every point that would have received a Rotha diagram box, those will now get an indeterminate ZIJ. Okay, so that is how we are getting this matrix here. And these varieties are defined on taking Northwest miners, which means that you select a position in your matrix and that tells you to take the miners of the submatrix that's northwest of that corner that you chose. So choosing this corner says that I'll be taking miners of this red submatrix here. And the size of miners that I take of this submatrix is going to be corresponding to the same entry in the rank matrix as in the the matrix that I'm taking my miners of, that, that corner I selected. So here, this corner corresponds to one in my rank matrix. So that tells me I want to take the one plus one size miners of this submatrix, which gives, for example, these generators here. I could do this for a different corner here, which would give us this blue submatrix, looking at the corresponding entry in the rank matrix that is zero. So that tells me I would take the one miners of this blue matrix, which would give us these generators. And you might be worried that you'd have to take all possible uh, of these 
southeast corners and take all of these miners. But due to a theorem of Fulton, actually, this uh, these miners are enough to give us all of the generators we need to generate our defining ideal. And those corners are precisely the essential set of the Rotha diagram of W, as Fulton noted in his paper, introducing matrix Schubert varieties. And so what those corners are, are the positions in your Rotha diagram where you don't have any boxes south and you don't have any boxes east, which is exactly corresponding to these two corners here that we chose. If you're familiar with matrix Schubert varieties, you can see that matrix Schubert varieties are special cases of these Kozdan Lustig varieties, where they're defined in almost precisely the same way, except the matrix that you take minors of is not dependent on uh, permutation V, it's just always going to be taking minors of uh, a matrix that's full of indeterminates Zij. But these matrix Schubert varieties are special cases of these Kozdan Lustigs. And even more special cases of these matrix Schubert varieties are the classical determinantal varieties. So taking the K minors of some rectangular matrix, for example, uh, those are also special cases of matrix Schubert varieties and thus special cases of Kozdan Lustig varieties. One other thing to note is that you can see by how we're taking these minors and the matrix that we're taking these minors of is it's possible that you could have uh, non-homogeneous or inhomogeneous generators for your defining ideal. And although in this case, you can see that due to using some of the other generators, while this defining ideal will ho be homogeneous, there are certainly are many, many custom Lustig varieties for which their defining ideals are uh, inhomogeneous. However, today we're just going to be talking about uh, cases in which the Kozdan Lustig variety is homogeneous. Uh, and thus, all of the gradings that we'll be using today will be just the standard grading. So we don't have to be too bogged down in the details of which grading. And some things that we can maybe look at for the coordinate ring that we're interested in studying. So we'd like to, of course, study the coordinate ring of the, the Kozdan Lustig varieties as we can of course, compute the minimal free resolution of our coordinate ring. Um, and from this data, some things that we can compute is maybe the K polynomial. So the polynomial whose coefficients are uh, alternating sums of these multi-graded Betty numbers, which tell us the multiplicities of these, uh, these free S modules here. Um, you might also be more familiar as the K polynomial popping up as the numerator of the Hilbert series, for example. Um, and another invariant that we can compute using these multi-graded Betty numbers is the Castelnuovo Mumford regularity. And this is defined by taking the maximal difference between the indices of the non-vanishing multi-graded Betty numbers. And so things that this regularity tells us is uh, sort of roughly, it gives us an idea for how complicated our minimal free resolution is. Uh, you could think that it, it's telling you about what are the dimensions of your Betty table. Uh, and more practically, it gives you a lower bound for when the Hilbert polynomial is going to equal the Hilbert function. So if you really want to know when those are equal, you might want to compute this regularity to give you that information. However, you often aren't going to want to have to compute your entire Betty table to extract this information because computing these Betty numbers can often be uh, computationally expensive, right? We don't have nice formulas for what those Betty numbers should be. So we would of course maybe like to have combinatorial formulas to actually compute these regularities without having to go through computing these Betty numbers. And luckily, in the case in which our coordinate ring is Cohen Macaulay, we know that the regularities of these coordinate rings can be computed by taking the degree of the K polynomial and subtracting off the co dimension of your ideal. And luckily, these Kozdan Lustig varieties are Cohen Macaulay. So we know that they will satisfy this, this 
these, this proposition. So we can use this trick maybe to our benefit to get some regularity formulas. Okay. So before we sort of delve deeper into the general, at least homogeneous cosmolistic setting, let's first just talk about matrix Schubert varieties. So I said before that these are, uh, are special cases of our cosmolistic varieties. Uh, so of course we can apply that proposition from the previous page to understand more about the regularities of these matrix Schubert varieties. So applying that we have that the regularity of these matrix Schubert varieties should be the degree of their K polynomial minus the co-dimension of the ideal. And in Fulton's work in which he introduced matrix Schubert varieties, he, uh, he notes that the co-dimension of these ideals is going to be the Coxeter length of your permutation. So the number of inversions in your permutation, which is easy to compute. So that's great news. And we also know by these, uh, by Buch's work and uh, Knutson and Miller that the growth and polynomial is going to be the K polynomial of our matrix Schubert varieties. So if we can compute the degrees of these polynomials, then we will have another formula for the regularity of these matrix Schubert varieties by just subtracting off the Coxeter length from the degree of this polynomial. However, it's not clear that there should be nice formulas for these polynomials. So in general, these polynomials are going to be inhomogeneous. Um, but luckily, we do have some nice combinatorial formulas that allow us to compute these growth and polynomials as weight generating series. And so let's look at those a bit. And first, we'll talk about a bit of a simpler polynomial, and that's the, the Schubert polynomials. So the Schubert polynomials, as noted in, in Knutz and Miller's paper, uh, the Schubert polynomials are the multi-degrees of matrix Schubert varieties. So this means that the Schubert polynomials are living inside of the growth and deep polynomials, making up all of its lowest degree terms, right? So there are many, I'm sure as you know, many combinatorial formulas to compute the Schubert polynomials. Uh, and so the one I'll talk about today is in terms of reduced pipe dreams. Um, and so I'm just going to, let's see, my pen isn't working. We're just going to talk about this formula and explain how we can compute these Schubert polynomials combinatorially through an example. All right. And so for that, we start again with the Rotha diagram for our permutation, which in this case, our permutation that we're working with is very small, just one, three, two. And what we do is we take our Rotha diagram and put a plus in each box. And then I just want to erase all of the extra junk that's not a plus and left align everything to get this sort of starting game board here. And from this starting game board, we can do certain local moves where the moves that we do is going to be, let's say we have a big rectangle of pluses and we have a lone plus here, where these are these dots here, here, and here are representing empty boxes. And one move that we can do is by allowing that plus that's all the way at the bottom to jump up diagonally. It's sort of called a ladder move. Okay, and so we can do all of these possible moves where this, this column of pluses, that's too wide, is any k, any integer k tall. So it could be nothing. And so here we can apply this move by looking at this, this region. And so that has a zero thickness of these k, k rows of these pluses. And so I can just move the plus diagonally like this to get this other diagram. 
And so we can write out all of the possible ways to apply these moves. And in fact, these are the only two ways for this permutation that you can apply these moves. And from your diagram, you extract a monomial. So the monomial that you associate is x i to the number of pluses in row i in that picture. And so in this picture here, there are no pluses in row one and there's one plus in row two. So that's gonna contribute this x2 here. And in this picture, we have one plus in row one and no pluses in row two. So that's gonna contribute this x1. Right, so this is one way to compute your Schubert polynomial. And it's clear from this definition here that the degree of the Schubert polynomial is going to be the number of pluses in any of these diagrams because the number of pluses is preserved by this, this local operation here. And the number of pluses was precisely the number of boxes in our Rafa diagram, which is equal to the Coxeter length. So we know for a fact that the degree of the Schubert polynomial is just the Coxeter length, okay? This is common knowledge. So the lowest degree terms of our Grothendieck polynomial is just the Coxeter length. Now, what about the highest degree terms? Well, we can compute the Grothendieck polynomials in a very similar way where we're using the same game board to start with. So we have start again with our Rotha diagram and we again just replace every box with a plus and left align all of the pluses and that's our starting board. And then we again, oops, we again will have a certain operation that we can do where we can move our pluses diagonally upwards, just like we had done in the Schubert setting. But for these growth and polynomials, we have another option for what we can do. And what we can do is not only just move our plus diagonally upwards, but we can also just leave one behind. And so just to make this clear, our plus can move diagonally upwards or it can leave a copy. Okay, and so when we think about using that here, we can look at this two by two sub square and do the first option of move or the second option of move. And that'll exhaust all of the possibilities here. And we assign the monomials in the exact same way where we'll just have some alternation in sign based on the degree of the term. But that'll be very predictable and we won't have any unnecessary cancellations. We won't have any cancellations. Okay. And so using this formula, we know that the degree of the growth and polynomial is going to be what is the most number of pluses that can possibly appear in one of these diagrams by applying these moves in any such way. And tying that back to our regularity formula, that tells us that the, the regularity of these matrix Schubert varieties is going to be the degree of the growth and polynomial uh, minus that Coxer length, which was the same as the degree of the Schubert polynomial. So in a sense, this regularity is also telling us about what is the difference between the highest and lowest order terms in our growth and polynomial. And summing everything up, we see that using that proposition, we know that the regularity is going to be the degree of this growth and polynomial minus the Coxeter length. So you might be tempted to just say, let's just use this pipe dream formula. And anytime I want to compute the regularity, I'll just write down what is the, mo the largest possible pipe dream that I could find and then subtract off the Coxeter length and be done with it. But the issue is as, as your diagrams get larger and larger, it can sometimes be very difficult to know whether you've made the right choices of moves or the right sort of greedy algorithm to get the biggest possible number of pluses. And so that's why whenever we were thinking about this question, we weren't quite satisfied with just using this rule and wanted uh, 
a more precise description of what the regularity in these degrees are. And so after the break, I will tell you about our formula for the case of vexillary permutations. I'll stop there for our break. Very nice. Um, 